Section One of A Little Book of Christmas. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Wales. A Little Book of Christmas by John Kendrick Bangs. Section One The Conversion of Hetherington. Part One. Hetherington wasn't half a bad sort of a fellow, but he had his peculiarities, most of which were the natural defects of a lack of imagination. He didn't believe in ghosts, or Santa Claus, or any of the thousands of other things that he hadn't seen with his own eyes, and as he walked home that rather chilly afternoon just before Christmas, and found nearly every corner of the highway decorated with bogus saints wearing the shoddy regalia of Kris Kringle, the sight made him a trifle irritable. He had had a fairly good luncheon that day, one indeed that ought to have mellowed his disposition materially, but which somehow or other had not so resulted. In fact, Hetherington was in a state of raspy petulance that boded ill for his digestion, and, when he had reached the corner of 42nd Street and 5th Avenue, the constant iteration and reiteration of these shivering figures of the god of the Yule had got on his nerves to such an extent as to make him aggressively quarrelsome. He had controlled the asperities of his soul tolerably well on the way uptown, but the remark of a small child on the highway made to a hurrying mother as they passed a stalwart-looking replica of the idol of his christmas dreams banging away on a tambourine to attract attention to the iron pot before him placed there to catch the pennies of the charitably inclined wayfarer omar oh, there's sandy claus now was too much for him tush nonsense ejaculated hetherington glowering at the shivering figure in the turkey-red robe the idea of filling children's minds up with such balderdash santa claus indeed there isn't a genuine santa claus in the whole bogus bunch the saint on the corner banged his tambourine just under Hetherington's ear, with just enough force to jar loose the accumulated irascibility of the well-fed gentleman. "'This is a fine job for an able-bodied man like you,' said Hetherington, with a sneer. "'Why don't you go to work instead of helping to perpetuate this annual fake?' The saint looked at him for a moment before replying. "'Speakin' to me?' he said. "'Yes, I'm speaking to you,' said Hetherington. "'Here's the whole country perishing for the lack of labor, and in spite of that fact, this town has broken out into a veritable rash of fake Santa Clauses.' "'That'll do for you,' retorted Santa Claus. "'It's easy enough for a feller with a stomach full of victuals and plenty of warm clothes on his back to jump on a hard-working feller like me.' "'Hard-working!' echoed Hetherington. "'I like that. You don't call loafing on a street corner this way all day long hard work, do you?' He rather liked the man's spirit, despite his objection to his occupation. "'Suppose you try it once and find out,' retorted Santa Claus, blowing on his bluish fingers in an effort to restore their clogged-up circulation. I guess if you tried a job like this just once, standin' out in the cold from eight in the mornin' to ten at night, with nothin' but a cup of coffee and a ham sandwich inside of you— "'What's that?' cried Hetherington, aghast. "'Is that all you've had to eat to-day?' "'That's all,' said the saint, as he turned to his work with the tambourine. "'Try it once, mister, and maybe you won't feel so cocksure about it not bein' work.' If you are half the sport you think you are, just take my place for a couple of hours." An appeal to his sporting instinct was never lost on Hetherington. "'By George!' he cried. "'I'll go you. I'll swap coats with you, and while you're filling your stomach up, I'll take your place, all right?' 
"'What'll I fill my stomach up with?' demanded the man. "'I don't look like a feller with a meal ticket in his pocket, do I?' "'I'll take care of that,' said Hetherington, taking out a roll of bills and peeling off a two-dollar note from the outside. "'There, you take that and blow yourself, and I'll take care of the kitty here till you come back.' The exchange of externals was not long in accomplishment. The gatherings of the shadows of night made it a comparatively easy matter to arrange behind a conveniently stalled and heavily laden express wagon hard by, and in a few moments the irascible but still sporty Hetherington, who from childhood up to the present had never been able to take a dare, found himself banging away on a tambourine and incidentally shivering in the poor red habiliments of a fraudulent saint. For a half hour the novelty of his position gave him a certain thrill, and no Santa Claus in town that night fulfilled his duties more vociferously than did Hetherington. But as time passed on, and the chill of a windy corner began to penetrate his bones, to say nothing of the frosty condition of his ears, which his false cotton whiskers but indifferently protected, he began to tire of his bargain. Gosh, he muttered to himself, as it began to snow, and certain passing truckmen hurled the same kind of guying comments at him as had been more or less in his mind whenever he had passed a fellow Santa Claus on his way uptown. If General Sherman were here, he'd find a twin brother to war. I wish that cuss would come back." He gazed eagerly up and down the street, in the hope that the departed original would heave in sight, but in vain. A two-dollar meal evidently possessed attractions that he wished to linger over. "'Can't stand this much longer,' he muttered to himself and then his eye caught sight of a group that filled his soul with dismay. Two policemen, and the struggling figure of one who appeared to have looked not wisely but too well upon the cup that cheers, the latter wearing Hetherington's overcoat and Hetherington's hat, but whose knees worked upon hinges of their own, double back-action hinges, that made his legs of no use whatsoever, either to himself or to anybody else. "'Hi there!' Hetherington cried out as the group passed up the street on the way to the station house. "'That fellow's got my overcoat!' But the only reply Hetherington got was a sturdy poke in the ribs from the nightstick of the passing officer. "'Well, I'll be jiggered,' growled Hetherington. Part Two Ten minutes later a passing taxi was hailed by a shivering gentleman carrying an iron pot full of pennies and nickels and an occasional quarter in one hand, and a turkey-red coat trimmed with white cotton cloth thrown over his arm. Strange to say, considering the inclemency of the night, he wore neither a hat nor an overcoat. "'Where to, sir?' queried the chauffeur. The police station, said Hetherington. I don't know where it is, but the one in this precinct is the one I want. You'll have to pay by the hour tonight, said the chauffeur. The station ain't a half mile away, sir, but heaven knows how long it'll take us to get there. Charge what you please, retorted Hetherington. I'll buy your darned old machine if it's necessary. Only get a move on. The chauffeur, with some misgivings as to the mental integrity of his fare, started on their perilous journey, and three-quarters of an hour later drew up in front of the police station, where Hetherington, having been compelled in self-defense to resume the habiliments of Santa Claus under penalty of freezing, alighted. "'Just wait, will you?' he said, as he alighted from the cab. "'I'll go in with you,' said the chauffeur acting with due caution. He had begun to fear that there was a fair chance of his having trouble getting his fare out of a very evident lunatic. Utterly forgetful of his appearance in his festal array, 
Hetherington bustled into the station, and shortly found himself standing before the sergeant behind the desk. "'Well, Santa Claus,' said the official, with an amused glance at the intruder, "'what can I do for you to-night? There ain't many rooms with a bath left.' Hetherington flushed. He had intended to greet the sergeant with his most imposing manner, but this turkey-red abomination on his back had thrust dignity out in the cold. "'I have come, officer,' he said, as impressively as he could under the circumstances, to make some inquiries concerning a man who was brought here about an hour ago, I fear in a state of intoxication. "'We have known such things to happen here, Santa,' said the officer suavely. "'In fact, this blotter here seems to indicate that one George W. Hetherington of 561 Fifth Avenue—' "'Who?' roared Hetherington. "'George W. Hetherington is the name on the blotter,' said the sergeant. "'Entered first as a D.D., but on investigation found to be suffering from—' "'But that's my name!' cried Hetherington. "'You don't mean to tell me he claimed to be George W. Hetherington?' "'No,' said the sergeant. "'The poor devil didn't make any claims for himself at all. "'We found that name on a card in his hat, "'and a letter addressed to the same name in his overcoat pocket. "'Puttin' the two together, we thought it was a good enough identification. "'Well, I'll have you to understand, sergeant,' bristled Hetherington cockily. "'None of that, Santa Claus, none of that!' growled the sergeant, leaning over the desk and eyeing him coldly. "'I don't know what game you're up to, but just one more peep in that tone, and there'll be two George W. Hetheringtons in the cooler this night.' Hetherington almost tore the Santa Claus garb from his shoulders, and revealed himself as a personage of fine raiment underneath, whatever he might have appeared at a superficial glance. As he did so, a crumpled piece of paper fell to the floor from the pocket of the turkey-red coat. "'I don't mean to do anything but what is right, sergeant,' he said, controlling his wrath. "'But what I do want is to impress it upon your mind that I am George W. Hetherington, and that having my name spread on the blotter of a police court isn't going to do me any good. I loaned that fellow my hat and coat to get a square meal while I took his place.' The officer grinned broadly, but with no assurance in his smile that he believed. "'Oh, you may not believe it,' said Hetherington, "'but it's true, and if this thing gets into the papers tomorrow morning—' "'Say, Larry,' said the sergeant, addressing an officer off duty, "'did the reporters copy that letter we found in Hetherington's pocket?' "'Reporters!' gasped Hetherington. "'Good Lord, man! You, you don't m m mean to say you, you, you let the reporters—' "'No, chief,' replied Larry. "'They ain't been in yet. I think ye shoved it into your desk.' "'Ah, so I did, so I did,' grinned the sergeant. Here he opened the drawer in front of him, and extracted a pretty little blue envelope, which Hetherington immediately recognized as a particularly private and confidential communication from, well, somebody. This is not a Cherche la Femme story, so we will leave the lady's name out of it altogether. It must be noted, however, that a sight of that dainty missive in the great red fist of the sergeant gave Hetherington a heart action that fifty packages of cigarettes a day could hardly inflict upon a less healthy man. "'That's the proof!' cried Hetherington excitedly. "'If that don't prove it's my overcoat, nothing will!' "'Right you are, Santa Claus,' said the sergeant, opening the envelope and taking out the delicately scented sheet of paper within. "'I'll give you two guesses at the name signed to this.' and if you get it right once, I'll give you the coat, and Mr. Hetherington number one in our evening's consignment of Hetherington's gets rechristened. Anita, growled Hetherington, 
"'You win!' said the sergeant, handing over the letter. Hetherington drew a long sigh of relief. "'I guess this is worth cigars for the house, sergeant,' he said. "'I'll send em around to-morrow. Meanwhile, how about, uh, how about the other?' "'He's gone to the hospital,' said the sergeant grimly. "'The doctor says he wasn't drunk. Just another case of freezing starvation.' "'Starvation? And I guide him? Great God!' muttered Hetherington to himself. Part three. "'Narrow escape, Mr. Hetherington,' said the sergeant. "'Ought to be a lesson to you, sports. What was your game, anyhow?' "'Oh, it wasn't any game,' began Hetherington. "'Huh! Just a case of too much lunch, eh?' said the officer. "'You'd had as much too much as the other feller'd had too little, that it?' "'No,' said Hetherington. "'Just a general lack of confidence in my fellow men, plus a cussed habit of butting into matters that aren't any of my business. But I'm glad I butted in, just the same, if I can be of any earthly use to that poor devil of a Santa Claus. Do you suppose there's any way to find out who he is?' "'Well, we've made a good start, anyhow,' said the sergeant. "'We found out who he isn't. When he comes to in the morning, if he does, maybe he'll be able to help us identify him.' "'Tomorrow,' murmured Hetherington, "'and who knows, but he's got a family waiting for him somewhere right now, and as badly off as he is.' "'You dropped this, sir,' said Larry, the officer off duty. "'It come out of the red coat. Maybe it'll help.' He handed Hetherington the crumpled piece of paper that had fallen to the floor when he tore Santa Claus's cloak from his back. It was sadly dirty, but on one side of it was a childish scrawl in pencil. Hetherington ran over it rapidly and gulped. "'Read that, sergeant,' he said huskily. The sergeant read the following. Dear Sandy Clurs, My popper says he'll hand you this here letter when he sees you to ask you not to forget me and Jimmy like you did last year. You ain't been to see me and Jimmy since popper lost his job, and he says it's because you lost our address. So I'm writin' to tell you We've moved since you come the last time, and am now livin' now on the top floor of 469 Varick Street, New York, where you'd ought not to find it hard to get down the chimbley, bein' on the top floor close to the roof, so I thought I'd write and tell you what me and Jimmy'd like to have you bring us when you come. I need some new shoes and a hat, and my last doll babies all wore out, and some candy if you can work it in somehow, not havin' had much since Popper lost his job, and Jimmy's only got one mitt left, and his shoes is wore through like mine is, only a little worser, and a baseball bat, and he'd like some candy too, if there was anything left over for us from last Christmas, which you didn't know where to find us to give it to us, we wouldn't mind having that too, but you needn't mind about that if it's mislaid. We can get along all right, all right on what I've said already. I'm eleven, and Jimmy's nine, and we hope you'll have a merry Christmas like we'd have if you'd come to see us. Your affectionate friend, Mary Mulligan. P.S. Don't forget the address, top floor, 469 Varick Street, New York. Take back chimney, middle floor. I'm sorry to say, Mr. Hetherington, said the sergeant, clearing his throat with a vociferous unction, that the town's full of Mary and Jimmy Mulligans, but anyhow, I guess this is good enough evidence for me to scratch out your name and enter the record under James Mulligan. Thank you, Sergeant, said Hetherington gratefully, and it's good enough evidence for me that this town needs a Santa Claus a blooming sight more than I thought it did. What time is it? Seven-thirty, replied the Sergeant. 
Good, said Hetherington. Shops don't close till ten. I guess I've got time. Good night. See you first thing in the morning. Come along, chauffeur. I'll need you for some time yet. Good night, Mr. Hetherington, said the sergeant. Where are you bound, in case I need you any time? Me, said Hetherington, with a grin. Why, my address is 561 Fifth Avenue, but just now I'm off to do my Christmas shopping early. And, resuming possession of his own hat and overcoat, and taking the Santa Claus costume under his arm, Hetherington passed out, the chauffeur following. These New York sports is a queer bunch, said the sergeant, as Hetherington disappeared. Part Four At half-past nine downtown was pretty well deserted, which made it easy for the chauffeur of a certain red taxicab to make fairly good time down Broadway, and when, at nine-forty-five, the panting mechanism drew up before the grim walls of a brick tenement numbered 469 Varick Street, the man on the box was commendably proud of his record. "'That was going some, sir,' he said, with a broad grin on his face. "'I don't believe it's ever been done quicker outside of the fire department.' "'I don't believe it has, old man,' said Hetherington, as he alighted. "'Now, if you'll help me upstairs with these packages and that basket there, we'll bring this affair to a grandstand finish." The two men toiled slowly up the stairs, Hetherington puffing somewhat with the long climb, and when finally they had reached the top floor, he arrayed himself in the once despised garb of Santa Claus again. Then he knocked at the door. The answer was immediate. A white-faced woman opened the door. Jim, she cried, is it you? No, madam, replied Hetherington, it's a friend of Jim's. Fact is, Mrs. Mulligan, Jim has— There's nothing happened to Jim, has there? she interrupted. Nothing at all, madam, nothing at all, said Hetherington. The work was a little too much for him today, that's all, and he keeled over. He's safe and comfortable in the— well, they took him to the hospital, but don't you worry. He'll be all right in a day or two, and meanwhile I'm going to look after you and the kiddies. The chauffeur placed the basket inside the door. You'll find a small turkey and some, um, fixings in it, Mrs. Mulligan, said Hetherington. Whatever ought to go with a turkey should be there, and, um, have the kiddies gone to bed? Poor little souls, they have said the woman. Well, just you tell him for me, said Hetherington, that Santa Claus received little Mary's letter, will you please? And, uh, and if they don't mind a very late call like this, why, I'd like to see them. The woman looked anxiously into Hetherington's eyes for a moment, and then she tottered and sat down. You're sure there's nothing the matter with Jim, sir? she asked. "'Absolutely, Mrs. Mulligan,' Hetherington answered. "'It's exactly as I have told you. The cold and hunger were too much for him. But he's all right, and I'll guarantee to have him back here inside of forty-eight hours.' "'I'll, I'll call the children,' said Mrs. Mulligan. Two wide-eyed youngsters shortly stood in awed wonder before their strange visitor, never doubting for a moment that he was Santa Claus himself. "'How do you do, Miss Mulligan?' said Hetherington, with a courtly bow to the little tot of a girl. "'I received your letter this afternoon, and was mighty glad to hear from you again. But I've been too busy all day to write you in return, so I thought I'd call and tell you that it's all right about those shoes and the hat and the new doll baby and the things for Jimmy. Fact is, I've brought em with me.' Reginald, he added, turning to the chauffeur, who stood grinning in the doorway, just unfasten that bundle of shoes, will you, while I get Jimmy's new mitts and the baseball bat. Yes, sir, said the chauffeur, suiting his action to the orders, and with a right good will that was pleasant to see. Reginald is my assistant, said Santa Claus. 
couldn't get along without Reginald these days. Very busy days they are. So many new kiddies in the world, you know. There, Jimmy, there's your bat. May you score many a home run with it. Here's a ball, too. Good thing to have a ball to practice with. Some day you'll be a giant, perhaps, and help win the pennant. Incidentally, James, old boy, there's a box of tin soldiers in this package, a bag of marbles, a select assortment of tops, and a fur coat. Just try that cap on and see if you can tell yourself from a brownie." The children's eyes gleamed with joy, and Jimmy let out a cheer that would have aroused the envy of a college man. "'You didn't mention it in your note, Mary dear,' continued Santa Claus, turning to the little girl, "'but I thought you might like to cook a few meals for this brand-new doll-baby of yours, so I brought along a little stove, with a few pots and pans and kettles and things, with a small china tea-set thrown in. This ought to enable you to set her up in housekeeping, and then, when you go to school, I have an idea you'll find this little red riding-hood cloak rather nice, only it's navy blue instead of red, and it looks warm. Hetherington placed the little cloak with its beautiful brass buttons and its warm hood over the little girl's shoulders, while she stood with her eyes popping out of her head, too delightedly entranced to be able to say a word of thanks. "'Don't forget this, sir,' said the chauffeur, handing Hetherington a package tied up in blue ribbons. "'And finally,' said Hetherington, after thanking Reginald for the reminder, here is a box of candy for everybody in the place. One for Mary, one for Jimmy, one for Mother, and one for Popper when he comes home. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you, cried the little girl, throwing herself into Hetherington's arms. I knowed you'd come. I did, I did, I did. You believed in old Santa Claus, did you, babe? said Hetherington huskily as the little girl's warm cheek pressed against his own. "'Yes, I did, always,' said the little girl, though Jimmy didn't. "'I did so,' retorted Jimmy, squatting on the floor and shooting a glass agate at a bunch of miggles across the room. "'I swatted Petey Halloran on the eye only yesterday for saying there wasn't no such person.' "'And you did well, my son,' said Hetherington. The man or boy that says there isn't any Santa Claus is a, um, is a, uh, well, never you mind, but he is one, just the same. And bidding his little friends good night, Hetherington, with the chauffeur close behind him, left them to the joys of the moment with a cheerier dawn than they had known for many weary days to follow. Part Five. "'Good night, sir,' said the chauffeur, as Hetherington paid him off and added a good-sized tip into the bargain. "'I didn't used to believe in Santa Claus, sir, but I do now.' "'So do I,' said Hetherington, as he bade the other good night, and lightly mounted the steps to his house. End of Section 1